welcome to the 700 Club. Thanks for joining us. Russian troops close to the capital city of Ukraine haven't moved in days. Bravely, skillfully, and creatively, Ukrainians continue to stand firm in their resistance of Russia's war machine. The blowback has been a ferocious air assault against Kyiv. The Kremlin is now fixated on bombing the civilian population into submission. CBN's Jenna Browder is in Washington with more. Officials say the airstrikes targeting civilians are meant to cause fear and defeat. For now, though, Ukrainian resistance appears to be holding. The Ukrainians continue to fight back very bravely and skillfully. And you've heard me use the word creatively, and I would say that that is, continues to be the case. With Russian ground troops stalled, the Kremlin is resorting to airstrikes. New visuals show the extent of the devastation. The city of Kyiv seeing its heaviest bombardment yet. One strike hitting an apartment building in the early morning hours. Another rocket crashing into a city street. CBN's George Thomas reports from the embattled capital. I'm about seven miles west of uh, downtown Kyiv, and uh, you really get a sense that the uh, assault and the bombardment of, uh, uh, of the capital city has just intensified. From the moment I arrived, it has been nonstop either artillery shelling or, like the other day while I was filming in this exact spot, I saw a Ukrainian surface-to-air missile intercept a Russian rocket. All of this happening while the Ukrainian Christians are still ministering. In fact, this church literally sits between Russian forces about seven miles in this direction and Kyiv, the capital city. And they say they are not moving, they are not leaving because they want to minister to the people. This as Moscow expands its assault to the western part of the country. U.S. officials warning the city of Lviv could be next. Russia believes it's a staging ground for Ukrainian resistance and western military aid. The more that Russia conducts strikes in the west of Ukraine and the more uh, Russian forces move in that direction, the greater the chances for miscalculation. Bradley Bowman with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies on CBN's Faith Nation. That's why it's so important, in my view, that the United States, working with our NATO allies, reinforce NATO's eastern flank in the Baltics, in Romania, in Poland, uh, uh, to deter Putin. Meanwhile, feeling the pain of Western sanctions, the Kremlin has reached out to China for military equipment. China is said to be considering the request, though Beijing denies it. The State Department with this warning. We will ensure that no country uh, is uh, able to get away with such a thing. And in Russia, a brave show of resistance when this woman crashed a newscast on Russian state TV to protest the war in Ukraine, shouting, stop the war, don't believe the propaganda. And leaders from Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia, all NATO nations, are expected to visit Kyiv today in show of support. Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky will address Congress tomorrow, and there are reports President Biden is considering a trip to Eastern Europe in the coming days. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, because of the war, more than three million people have fled Ukraine. Neighboring Poland now serves as the epicenter of Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. About half of Ukraine's refugees are crossing over into Poland. The majority are women and children unsure of when or if they'll ever return to their homeland. CBN senior national affairs correspondent Heather Sells reports on their plight. Maria Bakova hopes to return home with her three children at some point. For now, however, she is unwilling to expose them to war. I believe that kids shouldn't see the murder. They, they shouldn't hear the bombs falling on their city. That's why we are here. Her husband, a pastor, stayed behind to minister to Ukrainian soldiers. It's very difficult for three kids to leave, to leave their father, to understand that something can happen, and we don't know whether we see him as we hope that we see him, but nobody knows, so we just pray that God will stop this war. Bakova and her children have fled to Poland, along with more than a million others. About one in two Ukrainian refugees are choosing Poland, given the language similarities as well as centuries of shared culture and history. Plus, it's a NATO country. It's raising concern for Polish authorities and other European leaders 
as more than six million could ultimately flee Ukraine. There is no end in sight to the war, which means for now, millions to house, feed, and help process their trauma. Uh, uh, such little uh, kids maybe uh, don't uh, understand this, but uh, kids uh, about three, four years, they understand uh, all the tragedy. I think it's uh, 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 very hard for them. Officials estimate half of those crossing the border are children, and some are traveling alone. This 11-year-old boy sent here by his mother, who stayed back to care for her elderly mother. Humanitarian organizations like Operation Blessing are moving quickly to provide immediate help. And the European Union is urging member states to take advantage of a temporary protection directive. It gives immediate legal status to refugees and provides them access to housing, medical care, and education. It is the best vehicle to deliver immediate protection and it's also the best way to avoid a buildup of cases in the asylum system, which we all want to avoid. The temporary protection status holds for at least a year, giving these people hopefully time enough to regroup and seek a new life or return to Ukraine. Heather Sells, CBN News. So many stories of heartbreak. Thank you, Heather. Meanwhile, Poland's churches are responding to the crisis. One pastor who transformed his church into a refugee center is receiving assistance from CBN's Operation Blessing. Operation Blessing teams are on the ground in Poland, providing emergency supplies to Ukrainian refugees with the help of a local Pentecostal church. Vladislav Figlash has pastored the church for nearly 30 years. What you see, it is normally our sanctuary where on each Sunday and during the week we worship the Lord. But right now, because of the situation of the Ukraine, our duty and ministry is to help those people. So we put the church aside, put as many mattresses as we can to put the refugees whom we are helping to come across the border. Our duty in that ministry is to bring them from the border here, a safe place where we feed them, where uh, they can wash, they get any supply, what they need. And then other people from churches, volunteers are taking them to the destination place. So we are doing that uh, to bless those people, to help them, because as a Christian, we have to do it. It is our ministry according to what Jesus taught us, and we are doing it with great happiness. As Operation Blessing dropped off supplies to Pastor Viglash, we asked how our supporters could further help the church help refugees. One way is the financial support, because then we can buy or give the, use the money for certain necessary things. We need a supply or petrol, electricity. So it costs and financial support is the best way to help us. What uh, we would like to ask you, uh, it is just to stand all together in prayer, mostly for Ukraine, those people, and for those who are helping them. Thank you very much for, for helping us. We bless you, we love you, thank you. May the Lord bless you. Operation Blessing offering practical and meaningful ways to help. Gordon? Well, that thank you goes all the way from Poland, from a pastor's heart to you. If you've been supporting the, the refugee effort, the work of Operation Blessing, the work of Orphan's Promise, the work of CBN to help these people and help them in their tremendous hour of need. If you want to be a part of it, just give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to support the Disaster Relief Fund. We're creating a central fund, and then we'll distribute to either Orphan's Promise or to Operation Blessing, uh, specifically in Poland, also in Romania, also into the Orphan's Promise and Operation Blessing Centers inside Ukraine to help people who are in the war zone. You're a part of all of it by giving. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, you can count on me. I want to be a part of helping people in need. You can also go to our website, cbn.com. There's a place where you can designate your gift there. We have a new text, OB Crisis. Uh, so just type those letters in, OB Crisis, 
to 71777 and a giving page will show up. So, and either way, do it now. Be a part of helping people in their time of need. The Pool of Siloam, Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, the City of David. All these sites are linked together by one path, the same path that Jesus and other Jews walked as they made their pilgrimage to the temple in ancient Jerusalem. Archaeologists are in the process of uncovering this path for all to see. And now Chris Mitchell takes us there. They call it the biblical superhighway, the pilgrim's path that led to the Jewish temple in ancient times. The places and events and the peoples that make Jerusalem, Jerusalem, for Christians, for Jews, it all happened here in the city of David. This is where the beating heart of Jerusalem is. We're talking about the Pool of Siloam. We're talking about Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. We're talking about the city of David. The pilgrimage road links them all together. For Jews in ancient days, their pilgrimage began here at the Pool of Siloam. It's a mikveh or ritual bath. It's the size of two Olympic swimming pools. They would purify themselves here before going up to the Temple Mount to worship God. The historian Josephus says that 2,000 years ago on the pilgrimage festivals, there would have been more than 2 million people going up on pilgrimage. That's a lot of people who need to bathe. The pool is also where Jesus healed the blind man as recounted in the book of John. Its location was hidden by a road until 15 years ago when a sewage leak led to excavations, the discovery of the pool, and much more. The archaeologists, when they find the pool of Siloam, so they understand if that's the pool, and they know where the temple stood on the Temple Mount some 2,000 years ago. The same Temple Mount is today. Zev Orenstein with the City of David Foundation says, archaeologists wondered how the pilgrims traveled from the pool to the Temple Mount. So the archaeologists widened the excavation. And we are standing on the very answer to that question. We are standing atop the ancient pilgrimage road. These are the stones that Jesus would have walked on on his way up to the temple. And now the significance of the excavation of the pilgrimage road is that for the first time in 2,000 years, visitors will be able to walk all the way from the Pool of Siloam up to the Western Wall. The word in the Bible, the Hebrew words, is aliyah le regel, or mm -hmm. ole regel. Now what we understand that to mean is it's a spiritual ascent. You're going up to the temple, yeah. going to Jerusalem. It's a very holy place. But Chris, when you're in the place where the Bible happened, the words of the Bible come to life. Because as we're walking right now, and I'm sure you could feel it, mm -hmm. we're walking uphill. And it was more than that. This would have been like Times Square. You would have had on both sides of the road, and keep in mind, the road is about three, four, five times wider than what we see over here. You would have had shops, stalls along both sides of the road. This is the center of Jerusalem from a spiritual perspective, from a communal perspective, also from a, a commerce perspective. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, the road took 10 years to build from 20 to 30 AD and was constructed by Pontius Pilate. One of the major issues of Jerusalem is that it's a living city. All the layers, all the archaeological layers are built on top of one another and the modern uh, living uh, quarters and everything is built on top of the archaeological layers. Excavation manager Ari Levy says uncovering the road is a major engineering feat. We have modern neighborhood uh, just above our heads and we don't want it to collapse. After each meter that we take out, uh, each meter of soil, we enter an arch like uh, construction like this. This supports the entire weight of what we have uh, above us. Along the route, you can see many places where the road remains intact and others where it's destroyed given its violent history. We know that the Romans, they destroyed Jerusalem. And if you would find everything perfectly intact, well, it wouldn't seem like much of a destruction. Among the discovered treasures are small coins minted during the Great Jewish Revolt before the Romans destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in 70 AD. Scholars often wonder why the Jews made worthless coins instead of weapons. Orenstein has the answer. Jews of Jerusalem understood that the Romans were likely going to destroy the city. Hmm. But they also believed that one day in the future, their descendants would return and find these coins. And they would know what their ancestors lived and died for, for a free Jerusalem.
And here we are nearly 2,000 years later, standing along the very same pilgrimage road here in the city of David, in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish state of Israel. The city of David hopes the entire pilgrimage road, all the way from the Pool of Siloam to the Western Wall, will be open to the public within a few years. That will give visitors a first-hand experience of what it was like to worship God in the time of Jesus. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the City of David, Jerusalem. Well, it makes me want to go back to Jerusalem and walk those streets and walk that, that wonderful pilgrimage road. The stones are crying out in Israel. They're crying out the history of the Jewish people. They're crying out to the glory of the Lord. The archaeology today in Israel is proving the Bible, and you can learn more about how archaeology proves the stories of the Bible in our new DVD, Written in Stone, Kings and Prophets. For a gift of any dollar amount, the reason we're asking for a gift is we need to fund our latest film, which is Oracles of God. It's how we got the Old Testament. We're working on two films, one on the Old Testament, one on the New Testament. We need support for the production cost for that. So for your gift of any dollar amount, we'll send you this all brand new DVD. You also get exclusive instant streaming access in 4K on the CBN Family app. If you want it, just go to cbn.com slash written in stone, or you can call us 1-800-700-7000 and find out how the stories of the Bible are literally written in stone. Archaeology is Proving the Bible. I want you to have it. It's yours for a gift of any dollar amount. Convicted of first degree murder at the age of 18, Chris Wilson was sentenced to 30 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. His prison cell was his home for the next 17 years. Then Chris heard something on this program that helped to set him free. They were gunshots from the car that I was in. The young man that I was in the car with, I just figured, you know, he's shooting in the air. Chris C.S. Wilson didn't think anyone was in danger from the shots his friend fired from their car. The 17-year-old quickly learned otherwise. 30 minutes after I had heard the shots, I got a call on my cell phone saying that um, a young man's life had been taken. I, I was horrified. The next day, less than a month from C.S.'s high school graduation, he and his friend were arrested for murder. The first mention of me in a, in a newspaper would be for me being associated with um, the death of a young man. I did not know what was gonna happen. The son of two pastors, C.S. had always been a good kid. He was smart, popular, and a budding rap artist with his whole life in front of him. Now he was in a juvenile detention center in Danville, Virginia, awaiting trial for a crime he didn't commit. There, a guard slipped him a booklet with the Gospel of John. I knew God existed, but I kind of just didn't walk out my profession of faith at that time. I read it, and like that same night, I, I rededicated my life to the Lord, asking God to get me out of this, because I didn't do this. His friend, who admitted he had acted alone, was convicted of second-degree murder. With a confession and verdict, Chris's lawyer assumed the charges would be dropped and didn't build a defense. But when CS came to trial, prosecutors were eager to get another conviction. On April 3, 2003, at 18 years old, Chris was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 88 years, 30 beyond bars, 58 on parole. It was like a numbing effect, you know? It's just, it's like that real walking dead, because being in the wrong, wrong place, it would then cost me more years than I'd actually been on the earth. I was just in disbelief. I, you know, my faith was shaking. But when I uh, got myself together and I told God, I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna trust you and we were gonna fight. Standing by their son's innocence, CS's parents submitted numerous appeals and petitions to reopen the case. They were denied every time. As for Chris, instead of becoming angry and bitter, he chose to make the most of his time in prison. Whatever I was going to be at, I was going to serve him. I knew I was supposed to add value to people. 
And, um, and this is what I had a chance to do in prison. CS did just that and would grow as a dedicated follower of Christ. He led Bible studies, became an inmate pastor, and broke the record for number of baptisms in the history of Virginia's Department of Corrections. God is gonna do this because he's the God of justice. Like, he's the book, and I believe the word. Yet the years continued to tick by, and he was no closer to being free. In fact, even after the shooter issued a sworn affidavit confirming Chris's innocence in 2009, the court still refused to rehear the case. Seasons of um, depression and despair, um, being disheartened and dispirited, and I, I wanted to be home. Meanwhile, his family held fast in their prayers, clinging to any glimpses of hope. Lord, I'm going to trust you. I trusted him so that every year on Chris's birthday for 17 years, I bought him gifts because I was just looking for him to be home any moment. For over 16 years, C.S. read the Bible and prayed daily, leaning on God to get him through each day. He also watched the 700 Club. Of all the times he watched, one would lead to the break he needed. Yeah, after year of denial, um, November the 19th, 2019, it was probably my lowest point. And um, I, I remember watching the 700 Club, and um, I, I heard Pat Robinson say, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Meditating on those words as he prayed that afternoon, C.S. says the Lord gave him the name of a family friend, Bertie Jameson, a retired judge who served in Richmond. Chris told his mom, who reached out to Judge Jameson, asking if she had any contacts with the governor's office. She said it must have been God. She said because I texted her, and she looked at her phone and seen the text, and uh, she said she was sitting in the governor's office at the time. And so Governor Ralph Norland told her that if what you're saying is true, I'll investigate these claims, and um, we'll get Christopher out of there. On February 3rd, 2020, Chris was pardoned by the governor and released that April after spending 17 years falsely imprisoned. I cried and I, I rejoiced for the governor to exercise his power and say, no, nah, Virginia got this wrong. God didn't came through, I knew he was gonna do it. Chris left prison with a cleared name, a doctorate in theology, and big dreams for the future. Today, Dr. C.S. Wilson lives a life rich with gratitude and free from bitterness. I started my own tech company. It was just valued at $30 million. It is humbling um, at what God is doing. To be able to hug him, I longed for 17 years, and God had brought it to pass. He had 17 years worth of gifts to open. <laughs> he got me here. I owe my life to him. I'm dead to the alternative. You know, I'm here on account of God. We're all here on account of God. And when you just are still and, and l let yourself come to the realization, be still and know that I am God. It's in that stillness that you can hear his voice. It's in that stillness that you can feel his presence. It's in that you can know just how much he loves you. Sometimes all our agitation all of our complaining, all of that, it literally does nothing. But when we're still and we know that he is God, well, then things start to move and they move on our behalf. Here's a young man, he's convicted, he's sent to jail. Uh, it, it looks just horrible for him. And, and where do you go? You can go to anger, you could go to bitterness, you could go to resentment. Maybe things have happened to you that are unjust, that you didn't deserve, uh, you didn't ask for any of it. All of this happened to you and you're wondering, where is God? What, 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 can, can he help me? Can he be with me? If you would be still and let him work on your behalf, let him heal your heart, let him take away all that bitterness, all that resentment, all of that hate. Let all of that go. When you know how much he loves you, when you know that he is able, well, then suddenly mountains move. And what was thought to be impossible can happen for you. 
Now, here's Chris. He's in jail. What does he do with his time in jail? Well, he's just like Joseph in jail. He says, okay, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to do it God's way. Chris had a record number of baptisms inside jail, the largest number in the history of Virginia's Department of Corrections. Well, that's a miracle for a man who is unjustly convicted to turn that around and say, well, I don't belong here. I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm going to make the best of my time here, and I'm going to serve God here. He made a positive move with his situation, you can do the same thing. If you give up that bitterness, you give up that hate, you give up that resentment, what do you get in return? Well, you get righteousness, you get peace, you get joy. And then here's, I think it's the best part of the Christian life. You get the peace that passes all understanding where in the middle of turmoil, you can go to that special place with him and just be still and know that he is God. Whatever the circumstances are, you know he's working on your behalf. You know he's putting things in place for you. You know that he loves you and he's watching over you. It's one of the greatest things you can ever have to know that he is with you. When you have that, you have the assurance of your future, you know where you're going, and you know what you're doing in the here and now. If you don't know him, if you don't know this peace, bow your head with me, pray a very simple prayer. Jesus says very clearly, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Isn't that wonderful? If you're hearing this, it's for you. You can be the one. You can be the whosoever believes in him. You can be a whosoever. Say, Jesus, I I want you. I want you in my life. Bow your head with me. Let's pray that prayer. And Jesus will come to you. Jesus, say his name, close your eyes, bow your head, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you. And Jesus, I want forgiveness for everything I've done wrong. I want your righteousness. Take away all the bitterness, take away all the hate. Take all of that from me, Lord God and give me your righteousness, your peace, and your joy. Fill me to overflowing with the peace that passes all understanding. Be with me now, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you fill them to overflowing with your love, the love that we can never be separated from. Do it now, Lord, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. The Bible says that if we'll believe in our heart and then confess with our mouth, we shall be saved. What I want you to do is do that. Confess with your mouth. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I just prayed. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and I want to let somebody know. Now, when you call, I've got something for you. You can either get it as a download or as a CD, your choice, where you can can understand what it means to be forgiven. And, And can my sins be forgiven? A lot of Christians have that question. Can my sins be forgiven? Well, this teaching will will show you, yes, indeed. And what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? It's all free. There's no financial obligation at all. If you want it, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. We've been reporting on the rising cost of gasoline, the average national price for a gallon hitting $4.31 today. 
Now we're seeing a rise in fuel theft in parts of the nation, including Georgia, Virginia, and California. The manager of a Houston gas station says thieves used this fan to steal thousands of dollars of gasoline over a three-day period. The van drives on top of the fuel tank, and then um, that's all you see. No one comes out. They have a trap door inside their vehicle, which is crazy. Now, others are taking the more low-tech method of using a hose to siphon fuel from vehicles, while some use power tools to cut holes in gas tanks and drain the fuel. Gas prices have more than doubled in just over a year. U.S. sanctions banning Russian oil have ushered in the most recent surge in prices, jumping 66 cents in just two weeks. While well, Idaho lawmakers passed a measure aimed at banning abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. It would allow potential family members to sue a doctor who performs an abortion. The Idaho House overwhelmingly approved the bill by a 51 to 14 vote, garnering no Democratic support. The Senate had already passed it. Modeled on the Texas abortion law, the measure now goes to Idaho's Republican governor for his signature. While the governor has not sig uh, signaled what he would do, he did sign a similar fetal heartbeat abortion bill last year. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. In 2018, a shelter dog named Ruby became the National Search and Rescue winner of the Hero Dog Awards. Ruby's story was featured in the book Dog Winks by Squire Rushnell and Louise Duarte. Now she's the subject of a new Netflix movie called Rescued by Ruby. Here's a sneak peek. K9 unit. Best of the best. I'm gonna be one of those guys with one of those dogs. K9 team requires calm and focus. You're all over the place. You can't even sit still. I'm ready for this. The department has no money for new dogs. You think he could be a canine dog? She could be anything. You've been to seven homes already. You cannot blow this chance. She's a handful. She's too high strung. She chews, she digs, she steals food, she never sleeps. She's not even housebroken. Ruby? Yeah, I like a challenge. She's gonna be the first shelter dog to make a canine unit. Um, okay. Promises to be entertaining. Well, please welcome back to the 700 Club, Squire Rushnell and Louise Duarte. So nice to have you both with us today. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, Squire, let me start with you. Ruby's story was first featured in your Dog Winks book. So how did it wind up being made into a movie? Well, God was right there directing every single step. You know, this uh, story was, we loved it so much as a movie potential, and we pitched it to another network. And uh, to that network, we had to put forth three different ideas. And the president of the network loved dogs. So we knew this was going to be almost a slam dunk, but they chose one of the other ones. And we said, how come? And they said, well, you know, as much as Bill loves dogs, he hates to see them in jeopardy. And in Ruby, Ruby's in jeopardy from act one, right? From scene one. Ruby's about to be put down because she's um, unmanageable and, uh, and she's been rejected by seven different families. She's unadoptable. And then God brings in a wonderful God wink, dog wink, a state trooper who has a dream to be in the canine corps, but has hyperactivity. And God somehow or other divinely aligns him with this dog that has hyperactivity. They rise to just champion status and it's just a wonderful wonderful movie and stay to the end because the god wink is amazing <laughs> i want to ask you about that in a minute but louise this started out in the god wink book where did you find the story you know again it was god you know squire and i you know we we pray every day your and so a partner prayer every day and so mm -hmm. so we were praying and and that's where you know when people pray together consistently you do start hearing the voice of god so mm -hmm. much more clearly and so we came out of our prayer time and i said to squire i know this sounds weird but i feel like god is telling us we're supposed to do something with dogs so squire said dogs and i said yeah i don't know what it is so he was praying about it on his own he came back and he said okay what if we did something called dog winks god winks stories but a dog 
dog is in the center. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. And then we said, well, where are we going to get the stories? Then the next day, on my, I have a private uh, God Winkers page. And I went on there. And the first thing I saw was a woman <laughs> writes, hey, have you seen this great story about a canine officer and a dog named Ruby, a shelter dog? And, and then it was a little link to the Providence Journal. We looked at it. Squire made the phone call, started calling up all the principals. Next thing you know, he's on the Today Show with Officer Dan O'Neill and Ruby. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're in the offices of Netflix. Next thing you know, Thursday is a Netflix movie, Rescued by Ruby. Unbelievable. That God is her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, there's always a little bit of a God wink twist in your stories. This is a dog wink story. Is there a twist in the movie? Oh, this is a major, major God wink. Yes. Um, I, I wrestled with whether or not I should really tell you the end. Oh, come on. But it's in the know, book. Associated <laughs> Press has been telling everybody for the last three days. So here's what happens. These two uh, creatures come together, the hyperactive <laughs> policeman and the hyperactive dog. And it comes about because there is a woman at the, uh, at, the, at the shelter who is really advocating for Ruby, saying you can't put Ruby down. And her name is Pat Inman. And so uh, fast forward when Ruby and, uh, and Dan get to this champion status and they're like best of the team. And there is a call that there is a boy missing in the woods. Uh, and the canine unit is sent out. Ruby takes off, finds the boy at the bottom of a ravine and he is taken to the hospital. And Officer Dan goes to tell the mother that his her son is is safe and she starts to cry and she said have you ever heard of a dog named ruby no. he said ma'am that's the dog that just saved your life your she son's said, life yeah. your son's life yes and she said and and so he said that means that the dog you saved is the dog that just saved your son's life yeah major so god wing so and they're all through the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how are the boy and his mother doing today because this is based on a true story True story. Based on a two story. They are doing great. As a matter of fact, last night we did a big event for the Rhode Island State Police, our heroes. The, yeah. We love the police. And we showed them a screening of Rescued by Ruby. Pat Inman was there. Officer Dan was there. Ruby was there. The governor was there. It was it was so Colonel sweet. Colonel Manny was there. Colonel the Manny, who yeah. got us, he was the head yeah. of, of the um, State Police. State police. Yeah. And it was such a beautiful time to see the movie on a big screen with about 400 people. And it, it just touched our hearts because, you know, the police officers have been given a hard time the last couple of years. And, and they really are the ones who are unnoticed with all the miraculous, mm -hmm. wonderful work that they do for us every day. So this was to honor them, to honor the State Police, but also we're hoping that a lot of shelter and animals because of this movie will be taken home and realize if you just give them a little more love a little discipline mm -hmm. they'll be just fine well, i want our <laughs> viewers to know that rescued by ruby premieres on netflix that's this thursday here's an easy way to remember it march 17th and st patrick's day great way to celebrate yeah, it right green. exactly <laughs> so be sure to check it out you two always have something interesting going on and something that's fun for the rest of us so thank you and we look forward to watching the, the movie on thursday right. thanks Bye -bye. jerry good to see you both gordon what an amazing movie. What an amazing couple, Squire yes, and Louise. Are. Yeah, are. That's awesome. Well, every time it rained, Ruth worried that her house would collapse. A storm had already blown off part of her roof and knocked down a wall. Ruth knew she needed to move somewhere and somewhere safe. But since she only makes $3 a day, she couldn't afford to go anywhere else. Ruth Morella has been a single mother in Peru for six years. To support her three daughters, she sold snacks to neighbors. One day, a storm hit their community, and her makeshift house could not withstand the strong winds. The wind blew off the back of the roof and the wall. After that, living here was dangerous. Now, when a strong wind comes or the house moves, I've moved my daughters to safety. This is 10-year-old Yomira. I was very afraid that pieces of metal and wood from the roof will fall on us. Most stormy nights, Ruth says she now watches her daughter sleep. She's afraid that at any moment, the wooden timbers supporting the house could fall on them. 
She's also concerned about the impact of the cold, rainy nights. My youngest daughter always got sick with bronchitis and flu because of the cold weather and draft. During the pandemic, Ruth's sales suffered. There was barely enough to feed her daughters. There's not been any extra to repair the house. I made about $3 a day. With that, I made breakfast for my daughters. I stretched the breakfast food out so they could have a snack when they cried asking for food. There was not enough to eat. Operation Blessing first came to Ruth's community to develop a chicken program to help low-income families. We trained Ruth and gave her 100 chickens and a chicken coop to start a poultry business. For me, it was a chance to have an income, to support my family. It was a blessing because with the chicken and egg sales, I bought food for the girls and I started to save. And when we saw their living conditions, we built Ruth a new house with a kitchen, bedrooms, and a bathroom. We have a kitchen, I have pots where I cook and I have my bed to sleep. I am very happy. Thank you for giving me a house and the chickens. It was a dream that I wanted so much for my daughters. I am very happy in my new house. Thank you, 700 Club members. You're making dreams come true. You're having people around the world give thanks to God because of your gift. And it's wonderful when tens of thousands of people say, yes, let's get together. Let's do good things for people. Let's help people in need, whether it's refugees in, in Ukraine or that wonderful new house for that wonderful family, all made possible because you care enough to give. If you'd like to join with us, it's real easy. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. If you're already a member, I encourage you to increase, to say, I will go, I'll go to 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. We also have 1,000 Club at $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. When you call, when you join, I've got something for you. I want you to have it. It's my father's latest book. The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. It'll teach you how to understand the miraculous power of God. It's yours when you join, so call us, 1-800-700-7000. I think we've got some time for some emails. We do. So. And this first one, Gordon, is from Kalinda, who mm -hmm. says, I've been striving to figure out what my spiritual gift is, but no matter how close I get to God, no matter how much I pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, no matter how deep my desire is or how many times I ask, I don't feel like I'm hearing or receiving anything. It's quite discouraging. Can anyone receive any or all of the spiritual gifts, or does God only give us specific ones? And how can I figure out what my gift is? Belinda, the greatest gift, the greatest gift, for God so loved the world that he gave. The greatest gift is Jesus. So if you have Jesus, you have it all. Uh, one of my dear mentors, Harold Bredesen, who's gone on to be with the Lord, he liked to talk about when you go and, and get a pair of shoes, do you have to ask them for tongues? <laughs> and the answer is no, you don't. Um, when, when you get Jesus, you get everything. And he is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. One of the ways to prove that you have this is, are you listening for that still small voice? So Kalinda, instead of doing all the things you're doing, that, you know, how deep your desire, how many times you ask, just set aside some time where Jesus, could you talk to me? You said that if anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. And it doesn't stop there. I'll sup with you. That means there'll be a deep communion meal. You'll be able to hear his voice. So spend some time just in that quietude. Be still and know that he is God. And here's, something, here's, the, here's the question. Lord, what do you want to teach me in the Bible today? Could you show me a verse? And just be still. And when it comes to you, open that Bible and read it. And, and start this wonderful journey where he will guide you. Jesus will be with you. The Holy Spirit can lead you into all truth. And it's line upon line, precept upon precept. Let him instruct you. Let him show you the way. 
It's not by how much you beg or how much you fast or how much you give or how, you know, how many off times you go to church. It's not based on any of that. It's based on the free gift of God. Know that you're loved and you are a whosoever believes in him will not perish. Okay, quickly, Lucy, when fasting, how long is it supposed to last and should one only drink water during the fast? <laughs> well, absolutely drink water. Uh, lots of different uh, fasting techniques. Um, you know, a liquid fast with these wonderful blender things are, are very popular. It's up to you how long you want to fast. Uh, if you want to fast a day, that's great. If you want to fast two, if you want to fast 10, uh, I've started a lot of long fasts and I can't make it through. Uh, you know, I get around day 11 and I get, um, no, I got, <laughs> I got to gotta go eat something. But, you know, just do it to the Lord and, and set aside the time that you need for you. Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased.